It is so wonderful to see you all today. The house is full at the Montclair Public Library on such a gorgeous day. My name is Selwa Shami. I'm the assistant director of the library. And uh, I'd like to welcome you to our winter, is it winter? Our winter kickoff of Open Book, Open Mind Conversation series. Um, and the series is generously sponsored by the Montclair Foundation, Investors Foundation, and the Montclair Public Library Foundation. So today we have um, Taffy Brodesser Ackner. Um, her book, Fleischman is in Trouble, was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle's John Leonard Prize for Best First Book, named one of the 10 best books of the year by Entertainment Weekly in the New York Public Library, and one of the best books of the year by the New York Times Book Review, Time, The Washington Post, Vanity Fair, Vogue, NPR, and many other sources. So Taffy Brodesser Ackner is a staff writer for the New York Times Magazine. She's also written for GQ, ESPN, The Magazine, and many other publications. She will be in conversation with Jake Silverstein, who lives right here in Montclair, editor-in-chief of the New York Times Magazine. Now, after the program, Watchung booksellers will be in the lobby, and they'll be selling copies of the book, uh, which Taffy will sign after the program. Um, if you brought your own copy, I'm sure she'd be happy to sign your copy, too. So thanks to both our guests today for donating their time. Let's welcome Taffy and Jake. sort of regal. This is period. very regal. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you is, for visiting us. Yes. Are you going to be stepping back from your royal duties as well? <laughs> I am. I am. I'm, I'm getting the hell out of here and going to Canada. <laughs> That's what I'm doing. So I love that. I know. How about that? Can I, I mean, the way they did it, the way they just announced it? Yeah. Those people. And she... <laughs> But I he mean, was never fully in. He always was like looking for a way out. This may have been his long game. But she, I heard somebody say that she effectively kidnapped. She's essentially stolen a prince. Good, good, from, good. It's and incredible. They have, they have plenty of those there. Well, apparently their whole, the whole country seems to be collapsing in front of us. So anyway. <laughs> we wouldn't know anything about that. Um, <laughs> thank you all very much for being here. Uh, I'm Jake, this is Taffy, obviously. And we're going to chat for, I don't know, half an hour, 40 minutes, something like that, about Fleischman is in trouble. And then we're going to open it up to questions from you. I'm sure there are many here. Um, so, and if you come up with a question while we're talking, just save it, because we will definitely have a lot of time for all of you to ask questions of Taffy. Who has been on the road promoting this book and talking about it to lots of different audiences all over the country? since it came out, and it's probably been asked, we are talking about this beforehand, every single possible question that there is to ask about this book. And I, was try I like to try to, if I'm interviewing somebody, ask them a question that they've never been asked before. I don't think that's possible. Maybe not. Yeah. It may not be. This, we're just going to talk one. about health care policy. We'll see. Uh, for the whole time instead. But maybe we could start since, um, as I think was probably made clear from Selwa's generous introduction, uh, Taffy and I work together when she's not writing fiction. Hopefully you don't write fiction when we are working. <laughs> <laughs> we, okay. have a, we do have a <laughs> um, but so But so I'm familiar with, I mean, usually when Taffy and I are working together, it's on these great, big, important nonfiction journalistic stories that she writes for the New York Times Magazine. So I want to, which is the vast majority of the writing that you've done yes. prior to this book. So I want to ask you about the a couple of different questions about the differences between writing fiction and writing nonfiction. But first, whether writing fiction was something that you always wanted to do, right. uh, is, that, is that the case? I always just wanted to be a writer. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to make my money writing. And I went <laughs> to film school because I wanted to be a writer. And that program had no... Um, like science or math requirements, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and I got in. And that fit my criteria for an education. Right. And so, so yes, and I fell into journalism when I found out after college that they did not just hire you to write screenplays. 
Turns out. It turns out. Um, and I looked in the New York Times, which used to have a robust jobs section, mm. and I saw- You mean like with a little red pen? Like, with a pen, uh, I was like, I want to write that. So this, even though you weren't looking for a screenwriting job, this does sound like a screenplay. It was like the beginning of a uh -huh. screenplay that I would have written back then, which <laughs> is probably you. why I didn't do that well. <laughs> um, and there was a job there for a magazine called Soaps in Depth. And the, re the reason I enunciate it like that is because I would call and I'd say, hi, it's Taffy from Soaps in Depth. And they'd say, Soaps in Depth? <laughs> and I'd say, no, Soaps Although in Depth. Although that would be a pretty good magazine, because I mean, a lot of it was that things. magazine, right? <laughs> right, right, right. Soaps in Depth. <laughs> um, and, and I got a job there. At and Soaps then depth. a year later, because of my tremendous productivity and my good rapport with my interview subjects, I <laughs> was poached to a larger soap opera magazine, <laughs> which I do, I, it was larger. It was like Soaps in Depth was this big. Soap Opera Weekly Wait, this, was this I big. mean, this is not really what we're here to talk about, but I am interested. Did, <laughs> no one's asked did me these Soaps questions. Did Soaps in Depth did Soaps in Depth fight to keep you when the, the bigger magazine? Soaps in Depth could not have been more excited to get rid of me. <laughs> they, before I was even done giving notice, they were like, we, we understand, really. <laughs> Every time I would come in with an interview, they would say, another one, we're going to be here all night. They thought I was like a terrible writer. Oh, really? Yeah. Little did they know. Yeah. Okay, so so you started out. I think out, they still think I'm a terrible writer. <laughs> I highly doubt that. Um, so you you started out just wanting to write anything for money, but I guess my question was really whether, <laughs> as you were writing for soaps and depth, and then more and more magazines, and finally, obviously for GQ, many many celebrated stories for for them and for other national magazines, and then for the New York Times Magazine, were you always kind of harboring a kind of notions of fiction in your head? Maybe because when I decided to write this, it's like I had this like gut feeling of oh, obvious like this is the one as opposed. To, I guess like I always, I guess I never mean, moved on. This Meaning book? when I first, when my when I turned forty, my friends first started coming to me and telling me that they were getting divorced, and. I called, you know, I had this contract. I had, I had a contract at GQ and I had a contract at the New York Times Magazine. And the contract at GQ meant that I had to call GQ first with an idea and I called them up and I said, everyone I know is getting divorced and they're all on these apps. And my- You mean these dating apps? These dating apps. After they get divorced. After they get- Or well, who, who knows? knows? Who knows? <laughs> who knows? Um, and my editor said, you don't always sound like a clueless suburban housewife, but right now you do, because everyone's been using these apps for a million years, and our readers would not even understand what you were talking about when you would talk about these apps. So I said, fine, I won't write it for you. Your loss. Your loss, and I almost called up my editor at the New York Times Magazine, and then I thought, well, what is it? What would it look like? We would have reacted very differently. You would have. You would have. No, I think we could have done something on, like a div like a modern divorce, right? Like I think yeah. we could have. Well, part of what's so interesting could about have. the should we? Uh, it sounds like what you're. Perhaps we should. Let's do it. <laughs> uh, look for this article. Yeah. In the next about six <laughs> months from now. First. Um, but it sounds like what you're you're telling is essentially the origin story of the novel. Some of the ideas that sparked it in the first place your friends having divorces, these apps. And yeah. Stuff. But I think part of what's so interesting about it is it's not just the apps, the existence of the apps and how they're changing the dating world and practices. Right. It's that what happens when those apps fall into the hands of people who have already tried to date the old way. Right. And who are now in their 40s and kind of having a second chance at it. It's amazing. Yeah. I mean, from what I understand, <laughs> the idea that you could, I'm an incredibly, efficient person. Mm -hmm. I could do a lot of things while I'm doing other things. And the idea that you could be at home watching television and cooking dinner and dating <laughs> all at once is right. incredibly appealing to me. Right. And also, the idea of this like open market, like I was never good at dating. I was like 
there, I showed up where you were supposed to, and all I was was like, like too enthusiastic. I never knew how to like play dead or whatever you're supposed to do. <laughs> I don't think you're supposed to. <laughs> My mother I, was always trying to I tell me something, it's but I'm, it's not play dead. It's like hard to get. <laughs> and I'm not hard to get. I, I will jump into anyone's lap and start and just and say yes. Let's like, what should we do now? Like I have no, I have no use for the other thing. Do you think you would have been smoother if you had the apps to work with through? Yeah, because you don't have to be smooth anymore. You're like, here I am in this marketplace. It's like eBay. Mm -hmm. It's like Craigslist. It's like here is a, I offer my body as these goods. Right. Are you interested in these goods? <laughs> I will meet you here and we can exchange these goods. <laughs> it's really, it's like that. Right. I'm good at marketing copy, right? I mean, I'm a good writer. It's true. Like I could write, I mean, I could write the deck, the like, <laughs> subhead that makes you want to read the story. What, I mean, what else? What else? And part of what's funny is how overwhelmed Toby Fleischman, the protagonist of this book, is as he kind of, I mean, he's obviously thrilled at the, like, so the, thrilled. the wealth of options that he has in Manhattan. Um, but, but he's also overwhelmed. I mean, ha, like, as, what is it that you imagine? So there's a point at which Toby, he's having trouble figuring out his um, age range, the age yeah. range that he should yeah. set. Um, and he realizes that there's a certain age range yeah. that's kind of a, uh, like a, sweet a, gold, a sweet spot, a yeah. golden zone that, that is closer to his own age. Yes. Um, and there's, there's a line about how the women that he's meeting give him a kind of way back into the world or something like that. Right. Um, can you talk about, in, as you're writing the, the, those scenes where Toby is you know, both finding women to date and also going on dates, what do you think is happening for him as a character? While he's, while he's doing, I think he's like, He's like healing from his youth. Mm -hmm. He's also very short. He's five foot five, which is short for a man. And he, and whether or not that's really true, he has, that is like his hunchback. That is like the thing that he can't get beyond. Mm -hmm. And suddenly he can put down his like vital statistics and people accept him. Mm -hmm. And it kind of, it, it, it kind of um, obliterates the way that he, counted himself out. Like he is no longer counted out. And so he becomes this person who, who for the first time, can really experience dating, mm -hmm. which is not what he had before, when he was the shortest guy in the room, mm -hmm. when, he, when, when what he perceived as the wholesale rejection of him became, like, in, it incited in him a great need and it was probably more the need mm -hmm. that was repellent to women mm -hmm. than the thing he thought created the mm -hmm. need. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And then that, that seems like it also relates. I'm going to assume that most everybody here has read the novel, and we don't need to talk about who's who or what's what. So we're just, this is an advanced class, really. This is an advanced class. <laughs> so that also relates in a way to like how he and Rachel come together in the first place and what she signifies to him at that stage in his life. Right, which is just like someone to love him, someone mm -hmm. to make his life normal. Like that's what he talks about right at the beginning mm -hmm. when they meet. Like they go home together and, he, and, and they sleep together and the next morning he goes out and he gets bagels because that's a normal thing to do the morning after you slept with someone. And he's gonna go back and he's gonna have bagels with her and then they're gonna go for a walk and it's all gonna be normal and finally he has this entree into this life that he has only seen from outside. So let's fast forward to where things get a little difficult for the two of them, which to some extent seems like it has to do with the arrival of children, or at least that's part of it. I mean, always. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that I think is so interesting about the book is that it, it, well, there's, there's so many different ways in which the book kind of opens up and kind of reorients the way we think about relationships and marriage and parenthood. One of them is that the book I don't know of another book like this that revolves so completely, in, that's about a family, but that revolves so completely around the absence, the mysterious absence of the mother, right. um, and of the, the, in the in, in this case, Toby's attempts to try to kind of deal with that. What is it that, for most of the book, we're dealing with a family union with, in which, you know, Rachel is just mysteriously absent from it. And in some ways, that family unit of, of Toby and the two kids uh, wondering where she is and trying to kind of compensate in various ways becomes, it, there's so many interesting scenes in which you deal with the three of them that way. But what is it that you think is happening in that family unit where her absence is such a huge presence for them? 
and her absence is also so mysterious. You know, we didn't, we're never quite sure for so long in the book what exactly has happened to her. Right. Her absence is mysterious, except it's at first it's not. Right. He is used to her being inconsiderate. He is used to her sp uh, spending two extra days on a business trip without really talking to her husband about it. And and her presence, you know, I have two categories of friends who divorce, the ones who had kids and the ones who didn't have kids. And the ones who didn't have kids are fine and they can, they can have this relationship with this person, they could never see the person again. And the damage is not, does not seem great. Mm -hmm. But once you have kids, my family is, so extremely divorced. I had, <laughs> I had two sisters who got divorced this summer, almost like they were trying to promote my book for me. <laughs> and one of them had three children with her husband, and one of them did not have any children with her husband. And that one never has to see that guy again. And the other one is like in a, in a, like a constant log jam of negotiations with the other. And I think it's just a different, it's a different world. And I think that she could disappear. She could have died. A parent is so present for everything. I think about all the stories I've done about people who tell me that all their art is informed by a parent who was like, who when I evaluate the information was like mildly negligent, <laughs> like maybe worked too many hours. And it's very remarkable how in this, like there's this kind of lightning in, you know, our children, our children are like the same age. My children, my sons are nine and 12. And at this moment, it feels, I think one of the things I was grappling with when I wrote this is how I can't bear how important I am to them mm. and how big my presence is to them. And I specifically can't bear it when I'm in a room not with them and I'm writing this book and I'm not with them. Or I'm, you know, I wrote, I wrote this book while I was on a lot of business trips. I wrote this book as this, as what I felt to be an absentee parent. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. Is that, is that how Rachel experiences it? How the kind of the difficulty of not being able to bear how how important she is. Maybe maybe that's part of it for her. But more than it more than that for anything is the fact that she is in a community that's much wealthier mm -hmm. than she is. That has like kind of money that is so profound that there's that that anyone else who works there, if there are two working parents, they are doing it because they like their work as opposed to what my husband and I are doing, which is like, <laughs> like trying, to, trying to survive. Um, and I think that what she is doing is, is grappling with how important she is and also knowing that she has no choices. And the thing that nobody ever says to the husbands in my life is, wow, that must like, oh, that's me, um, <laughs> the, the, that, the implication is that the woman is making choices where the husband is just doing what he has to do when he's out very late. I live, I live near here, I live in a suburb, and I'm very, very lucky for the other mothers at my kids' school because they feel bad for me and they drive my kids <laughs> to carpools and they call me. There's a scene in my Gwyneth Paltrow story where I have not picked my, I am in California and it is time to pick up the kids from soccer. And someone calls me and it's like, are, are you almost home? <laughs> and I, I say, no, I'm at Gwyneth Paltrow's house um, in California. Um, and it gets to be too much. But there's this idea, I think, that, that I could have made different choices. And maybe I could have, but so could everyone else have. So could my husband have. Um, I think I didn't, I think like Rachel, the, I think the difference between me and Rachel is that, is that she realized how important money was from the beginning, whereas I became a writer. <laughs> <laughs> and then married and another that, one. <laughs> which is why you bear much more similarity, not to Rachel, but to Libby in the book. Um, well, people have said that. Yeah, people, people have people said, said that. that. Um, who becomes a writer and then leaves her job and becomes a stay-at-home mother right. and has many thoughts about that yeah. as well. 
Um, I'd like to talk for one of the things that's so fun about the book is that in addition to offering us many profound truths about marriage and <clears throat> uh, parenthood, it also offers us many interesting and insightful thoughts about the magazine business. Oh my God. And, and in particular, the men's magazine business, which you spent a good deal of time in and wrote some really brilliant stories in, despite the fact that that whole wing of the magazine business has much, many problems. Yeah. Um, the character of Archer Sylvan. <laughs> Why does that make you laugh? It makes me laugh just because he's my favorite. He's just my favorite. I, you, no one's ever asked me about him. You, really? Uh, you, you, you did it. Oh. He did it. He did it. Look at that. We're not even, so, we're like not even halfway done and he did it. Part Amazing. of what's interesting about him is that he, he I mean, you know, you, you sort of, he's a character he's sort of, you wonder exactly who he's supposed to be. He's probably a composite of various people. Yeah. Um, uh, how would you, let me, just so for the audience, how would you kind of describe the type of journalist that he is? And you don't have to say exactly who he is a composite of, but what does he stand for? He's this composite of all of these, like, these um, chest beating, hyper masculine, do whatever they want, Hemingway type of people who write about American masculinity. And I came into men's magazines, I think I wrote my first story for GQ when I was, when I, it, maybe 2012, 2013. And those guys were on their way out, having endured the insult of like no longer being on private jets. Like our, our overlap was brief, but we, mm -hmm. but because men's magazines love men's magazines. <laughs> there, are all, there are very often these parties that are like, it's, it's the fifth anniversary of that guy's going away party. <laughs> we're, we're, we're all going to, it's not Smith and Wesson, Smith and Walensky. <laughs> Smith and <laughs> no, it's something it disgusting. Well um, it's, we're going to Smith and Walensky to eat a side of beef that was killed in front of us. <laughs> And we're going to talk about the good old days. And I would sit, because I had nothing to say. And also, I won't eat uncooked beef. <laughs> and so I would sit there with the trough of creamed spinach. And I would listen to these stories, and these stories about what they used to get. What, what do you mean, what they used to get? You mean the men's, like what, how you were treated as a oh, men's uh, magazine. Uh, uh, uh. I listened to, a, listened to a story. I was on contract at GQ when I heard a story reminisced about, about some, some time 10 years before where they, where they had flown supermodels to some country, I can't remember which one, so that they could have a photo shoot with tigers. They got there only to find out there were no tigers. <laughs> and so they flew in tigers. <laughs> and that very week, I was called up and asked why I had to um, check a bag, like $25 <laughs> American Airlines check a bag fee. That's what they wanted to know. Wow. So things had changed, but they had all of these stories. And also, it was men's magazine writing as I always wanted it to be. Right. Something That's that I wasn't really allowed entree into, mm -hmm. and I thought for a while it was because of the timing, and then I realized, and that's what Libby realizes, is that it's because she's a woman. But the way men were writing their men's magazine stories felt very much like the closest you could actually come to living, right? Mm. To like being there, to being in the room, and, and, and having this monumental experience of life. And I kept thinking, one day I will get it. Mm -hmm. But I never got it. I was sent on stories th where that you couldn't send a man to because the, um, because the subject was wary of men or, the, um, or it was a woman's issue and it was too delicate. Um, and I remember this one night when I was offered the full-time job at the New York Times. And I was so sad to think that I was going to leave GQ before I ever did this thing. I remembered this Mike Paterniti story where he goes to the top of some mountain in Spain and he eats the heart of a, of a <laughs> lamb while, like, while looking in the eye of the chef. 
<laughs> like that, that's the scene. I thought you were going to say the lamb, so. <laughs> that that would be rude. That's better. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, they're ne they're, they were, they, I, and I thought, I'm not, I haven't yet been sent to the top of Spain to eat this thing over the thing. <laughs> and then I realized I never was going to be, I was never going to be sent. And that, this idea that I thought I had like, I thought I had circumvented some kind of rule mm -hmm. and that I was this exception and I wasn't. I was just well, me. I want you to know, and I say this in front of all the people here, we're going to send you to Spain. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. I keep trying to get one of those departures issued gigs. <laughs> so the one, the one last thing I'll say about that is that I think part of what's interesting about that <laughs> is that in your own magazine writing, um, you, Libby, the, the sort of former magazine writer and narrator of the novel, um, admires Archer Sylvan's style, yeah. just in the same way that you described just now that men's mag, there's certain kind of like literary the men's magazine style, yeah. Patternity is a good example, um, that, that uh, had, a, had a real and deeply influential effect on a lot of magazine writing in the 80s and, and even earlier, um, that Libby admires that in, in Archer Sylvan, but then she also notes how he's kind of fallen out of favor over time. And I, part of what it seems interesting to me about bringing that up is that you yourself have so thoroughly kind of claimed some of that style or claimed at least some of the mode that um, a lot of those kinds of pieces have, uh, what, what, those, what the mode of those pieces achieves, which I think you just described really well is making you feel as if you're there. The, the, the conventions of the situation have been sort of cast aside. You are, you as a reader are present. You're understanding all the strange dynamics of the, di of the relationship between the, the author uh, the, the, the reporter and the subject, and you know the feeling of being there in the room is actually rendered on the page. Thanks. It's true. You do that Thanks. very well. Thanks, boss. And <laughs> it, but it is true that that often was kind of the province of men's magazines. Yeah. I think it's interesting that that's been some of the kind of uh, sexism of that has been shed, and that style is now much more, you know, ambient throughout the whole industry now. But it's not a it's not an accident that I came from a men's magazine and that my editor. Was had been at that men's magazine, mm -hmm. and that like it was a language that I knew how to speak. Right. Whereas I didn't know if I necessarily knew how to speak the language of like a fancy, a fancy New York Times art. Like I read that I read that Boeing story. That's a fancy story. <laughs> Some of these stories are so are fancy, and I don't know if I could have done. I don't know if that's a thing that I'm either capable of or that I understand why it works well enough to execute. So I'm very, very lucky. And it, and a good thing to do that on is, is profiles mm -hmm. because you come in with the stakes being pretty low. Profiles have been so done to death that all you have to do is make sure they're true and then you can experiment with mm -hmm. them, right? It's like um, it's like what the chefs say about like roast chicken. Like they all when they all, when chefs all get together, they make for each other roast chicken because that's the thing that you're supposed to show from this place of plainness what you could do with it. And that's how I think of profiles, the roast chicken <laughs> of journalism. So far, the the menu from this conversation. I know, I know. Roast chicken, raw heart, beef. Heart of an animal. Heart of a lamb. Cream spinach. Trough of cream spinach. <laughs> <laughs> I'm starving. <laughs> so this is a divorce book. I mean, obviously, it's a, it's a dating book, and it's a lot of things. But it, it really is a divorce book. And I wonder, to what extent is it OK that we talk about your own parents' divorce? And like, that's fine. Yeah? Yeah. You talked about your sister's recent divorces. But I mean, your, your own, you've talked about this in other interviews, your own parents' divorce yeah. um, loomed large over your life as a kid, of course, as it does for any, any kid whose parents get divorced. Um, and it seems like, in some ways, it must play into this book, or at least into how you think about what happens to a family unit when the parents get divorced. Was that something that you were actively aware of? Did you did it surprise you sometimes how your own un understanding of your folks' divorce came up in the, in the writing of this book? I was shocked. I thought I was writing a dating book that where the only where where the situ the I wanted to write about dating. That's what I wanted to write about. And the other things followed very quickly 
because one, because first of all, you need a situation. Why is this person just dating now with these apps for the first time? Um, easy, he's been divorced. Um, I did not realize that the, the, the more profound things I wanted to say were about divorce or about mid, midlife. Mm -hmm. I mean, midlife is pretty shocking to me. <laughs> like I did not know how confusing it would be mm. to be at this particular age. Like a second adolescence. It is, it's like, it's, it, it, I mean, it's like, it's like a second adolescence, like where at least when I was an adolescent, I thought I knew what I was doing. <laughs> Whereas now I know well enough to know I don't. And the constant strains of contentment and, and being distraught, like in, in line with each other, you know, like the, the way I can, it's the way I feel about the suburbs. Like I can walk down the block and be like, this is beautiful. What kind of person finds this beautiful? <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly my experience <laughs> of living in the suburbs, and 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 that's middle age for me. Divorce. <laughs> my parents were divorced when I was six, and I did not know that I found that I did not an, I, I did not know that that affected me so deeply until I got married. Mm. Until I got married and. And I realized I had no model for what a marriage is supposed to look like, except for 30-something, which I used to watch. <laughs> um, and I had no way of understanding how these things are supposed to last. And a thing I saw all around me is that in any situation where we are unsure of ourselves and worried about something, whether it's about our children. You know, I went to like three meetings at the school this week about technology. And we have all these meetings. Nobody ever talks about their marriages. Nobody is ever, nobody ever humbly discusses how afraid they are that they're going to fall apart. Because I can tell you that all of these friends of mine who came to me when they were, I was at all their weddings, mm -hmm. and they were as happy for me, they were as happy on their wedding day as I was on mine. So what happened? Mm -hmm. And why was it such a secret? And why couldn't we talk about it? Um, yeah, some of the most I found some of the most interesting scenes in the book are there, or just wonderful moments in the book are when Toby is being grilled by the women who he kind of runs into in the neighborhood, who are essentially trying to ask the same question, like, yeah. "What happened? Is it going to happen to me?" Right. It's like when someone it's like when someone tells you, like when you hear someone has cancer, and then the first question people are like, "Did you eat organic food?" <laughs> and it's, it's, all these questions are really about you. Did you have a date night? Did you have all of those right, things? Right. And who can, like, who can say? I think that there should be more humility. And the, way, the only place I saw that, because once I was writing a divorce book, I was pretty concerned about giving my husband the news that while other people's first book was like <laughs> a coming of age novel, et cetera, my book was a divorce book. <laughs> How many, um, have any panel moderators on your book tour asked you how your marriage is? Everyone has. Really? And it is astounding. When you were, when you were like, I hope it's okay to ask about my, your parents. I'm like, my parents? People ask, people are like, is your husband here? People say, is your husband here? And then they ask him. And is Claude here? He's not here because we thought it was in an hour. Because we, it was, a, it's a long story. He's, he's a, he's a, He's at soccer tryouts um, for our children, oh, okay. but yeah, <laughs> he's not taking it up. Um, but he he says he he says the the only thing that I think is actually correct, which is when people would say that to him, he'd say, "Oh, she's obsessed with divorce," <laughs> and it's true. And I didn't know I was, you know, like you don't know that you're obsessed with things that you're obsessed with. I guess I'm obsessed with divorce, and I'm and I'm obsessed with seeing them coming. And I'm like I and I have a weird gift for, for knowing when someone's about to get divorced. Oh really? Yeah. What and what do you do? What do you? I don't do anything when you I don't do I anything. Tell, I tell my husband. I say keep an eye on those two. Or have if ever, we haven't have heard, have you ever saved a marriage that you could see was headed for divorce no. by intervening? But I've but I have Maybe made some people. I th I've given them someone to talk to when I have if it's someone I'm very close with. I've said, is everything going okay? People who are about to get divorced are like. Yeah, what are the signs? Well, they're like, like, 
some, I once went on a, uh, for a, for a magazine story, I went to a, a, like, a well, like a bazillion dollar wellness retreat that was modeled after the idea that when animals are sick, they go into the woods and starve and, <laughs> and, and don't come out till they're healthy. And that's what happens. You don't, you don't see them. Like, ask yourself, who have I not seen in the last three months? And who was like, who was at that thing where they, where usually both of them would be? And also, why were they on different sides of the coffee machine at the parent-teacher conference? I mean, I'm those sound like kind of obvious signs. They're not always. No. I mean, maybe they are. Maybe you all have. Maybe you I mean, have they're that. standing on You're a journalist, stuff. too, Jake. <laughs> you can do this. He's good. You can tell. Well, so Claude, so Claude had a reaction when you said my, my first book is going. Yeah, Claude, yeah. your husband, had a reaction when you said that your first book would be about divorce. Was, what about when you said it's also going to be told f kind of from the perspective of, of a man? He was fine with that because I had a lot of experience. I wrote about, I wrote almost exclusively about men at GQ. It's very So that wasn't hard for you? No, that was the that was not just easy, but it was the only thing that made So if you have two sets of friends who are coming to you and they're like, "Listen, I got divorced, but look at my phone." The men's phones are amazing. Well, you mean showing you the yeah, apps, the apps. The stuff that They're like, the "Look incoming. at my apps." Mm -hmm. And these women who are so smart and beautiful and cultured and interesting and excited, that's what you see. What do you see on the women's phones? It's terrible. <laughs> so a, so I, a friend of mine, a, a few weeks before my book came out, came to my house to, to change into her date outfit, because she didn't want her teenage daughters to see the truth. And I said, who, and I said, who, who are you going out with? And she showed me her phone. And it, it said, this is what his, his, um, his marketing co um, profile, his profile said. It said, listen. My ex-wife was really manipulative, and I sold. And I and I and, sh and I have put up with more with more mind games than I need in a lifetime. If you are like this, please do not swipe. But if you are someone who is normal and won't give me grief and won't manipulate me, I will go out with you. Mm. And I said, why? Why did you say yes to this guy? And she said, this is all there is. So what, <laughs> interesting. So what, what conclusions? You're a, you're a um, it's true. observer of the culture. What conclusions can we draw from the fact that recently divorced women seem very healthy and ready to get back in the scene, and recently divorced men, according to this survey that you've just given us, um, <laughs> science, scientific seem deeply wounded and, and maybe broken by their experience of divorce. What are the conclusions that you made wrong? You are projecting a woundedness <laughs> and a, like a vulnerability, whereas what actually is going on is that, is that there's been a revolution and nobody told the men about it. Mm. And the men are completely bewildered by the fact that some of the women in their lives are out earning them. Some of them are more successful than they are. Some of them are better liked. And these men, they thought they were feminists. They were, it happened right in front of them. They were rooting for their wives. But nobody told, when I, in the 70s, was being told I could go out and do anything that I want, nobody was telling like you, right? We're close in age. Nobody was telling you that like, hey, just so you know, there's not gonna be a martini waiting for you at the door when you grow <laughs> up. Like, there's no more martini. Right. Or maybe you're bringing her a martini. We don't know. Right. Nobody told the men. And so the men are very angry. And this is like this crazy inflection point that we're at right now. And how, how, how does Toby handle that? How do you think Toby handles that? Toby thinks that he did everything right. But did Toby do everything right? He did not do everything right because he didn't accept that his wife still bore the weight of everything that, that the woman traditionally had to do in the kind of social department, right? And also earn, all, earn a lot of the money. I mean, he did well, but he didn't do Manhattan well. Mm -hmm. You know, he's like, he would do like Maplewood well, not even Montclair well. He couldn't <laughs> afford your property taxes. <laughs> your property taxes are crazy. 
Are we going to have a whole sidebar about that? We, maybe. I mean, if you want my opinion, you have it now. <laughs> is, there, is, there, is there an official I can speak with after <laughs> the? Um, we're going we're gonna to just have a couple more questions and then have ample time for all of you to ask your questions. Um, so one of the interesting things that's happening now, so this book has been a massive success. We heard a little bit about what a success it was at the beginning um, in terms of all the accolades that it's won and all of that, richly deserved. Thank you. Um, it's also now being turned into a television a, show. A television show. Yes. Um, that's, that's been announced, but maybe not everybody saw that. So, and you are writing the television show. So. Hands. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Can you tell us just briefly the kind of basic information about what the show is, who, yeah. where it's going to be, and all that? It's being produced by ABC Signature, which is the newish prestige arm of ABC Studios. They made Unbelievable. Mm. Um, it will be broadcast on FX. So it's a little gritty. And um, the, and the, I have great producers. I, it's the first time I've ever worked for women, other than at the soap opera magazine. <laughs> so wish me luck. Full circle. Um, but it's, it's, it's been a, it's nine episodes, and I'm writing it now. And it, it's very hard to write. Yeah, that's what I want to talk to you about. So you, you, is it, like, is the, First of all, it's TV, right? So yeah. it's not a film. Right. So you can probably do all sorts of things. That are you are you trying to be have a lot of fidelity to? Yes, the, they want it very faithful to to the book, um, at least for the first season. Mm -hmm. They talk about a second season because that's all they can do. That's all TV executives can do. They're like they're sharks. They can only swim forward. Mm -hmm. um, they have ideas for the first season. They don't want anything different. They want it to mimic the book as much as possible, which sounds easy and is not. <laughs> What's hard about it? What's hard about it is that, is that if, you think of, if you think of what my specific skills are. Um, what are they? OK, I'll tell you what one of them is, I think, is that when there is no story, I can still write a story. I, like, this is I, true. I came to, I came to prominence true. on a story about Nicki Minaj in which I went to interview her and she remained asleep for the duration. <laughs> <laughs> and I wrote a whole story. I wrote 6,000 words about what I would have asked her had she been awake, what I think she would have said, and, and how we all should sleep more. It was, it was, it was, it was, it was a roller coaster. Um, and, and if my main beat is celebrities, there, I'm, I think that, especially at GQ, and, in, and when I do work for Arts and Leisure, I'm often sent to people who are volatile <laughs> or boring and that you don't really know what you're going to get out of them. Like mm -hmm. my most recent was Tom Hanks and nobody knew how that would go. And I also did Tanya Harding, right? And <laughs> made it. Um, and so if that's the case and the thing that I can do is write sentences and paragraphs in place of actual action, if you strip down my book, how much of it is action versus sentences? Mm -hmm. Is it nine episodes? I hope so. This is <laughs> so is Nobody the, tweet this. Don't tell, don't tell them at ABC, because <laughs> the money's it, good. Don't, you, are yeah. you finding it more challenging to go from fiction writing to screenwriting or than you did from, to go from magazine writing to fiction writing? Magazine writing to fiction writing was amazing. It was like, because the book is like a profile. Mm -hmm. Like That's how I kept it in my head. It's just a long profile that I'm making up. And the hardest part of it was that whereas I think I'm a decent observer of people, to make people up and then have to observe them is to kind of deny mm -hmm. what is so amazing about people, which is that they are always con they always contradict themselves yeah. and they're unpredictable, whereas creating something is to create a series of predictable things. On the other hand, I sort of imagine when I was reading this book, you're so often in a situation, any journalist is, but I think particularly somebody who deals often with celebrities, that you're trying to understand the inner life of somebody who is doing a lot to prevent you from understanding oh what's yeah. happening on the inside. That's what they do. And so I was imagining reading the book that it was 
tremendously satisfying for you to just be able to feast on the inner life of somebody with who, you know, there were no barriers whatsoever. You could go all the way in. And also, like, to not have to worry about the metrics of kindness mm -hmm. or conscience, right? Like, I have to tell you that a very hard thing about my job is that I am forever made uncomfortable around that person. No matter how well the story mm -hmm. goes, mm -hmm. if it doesn't go well, like... So Bradley Cooper doesn't come over anymore? Bradley Cooper does not come over anymore. <laughs> but also, if the hangover comes on, I am, I'm like, <laughs> we have to change this. <laughs> and now, one castaway comes on, and that, like, it's pretty remarkable how many people have made the amount of movies that I would like to watch and no longer can. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, all right, so we're, we're, we've been talking for about 45 minutes. So let's take some questions from the lovely audience here. Uh, we have if you have any, those were great. Thank you, Jake. Oh, well, I got one that hadn't been asked before. That's I mean, I'm really proud of myself. Um, Selva is gonna, has a microphone here. So if you had, just, yeah, raise your hand and we'll get your question. I'm first, great. Hi, so I have a question. When I started to read the book, uh, I was enjoying it. And then when I realized that there was gonna be a first person character, I said, what? Why is she doing this? Where is this coming from? As I continued reading, it became more and more clear, especially, let's say, in the last third of the book. Could you talk to that? I mean, what, why did you feel that you needed a first person character in order to explain Toby? Um, to, well, interesting question. It is an interesting it, question. Because it comes across as initially as a third person right. novel. It does, although there are true. hints. In the first paragraph, there is an, an hour. There's an mm -hmm, I, mm -hmm. but it, it, I hear this a lot. Um, there are two reasons, one of them intentional and one of them not. The, uh, the unintentional is that I wrote the book first in third person. Um, and my goal was that by the end of this book, you would realize that you were reading the book that one of the characters in the book had written. And nobody got it. <laughs> and so in a panic, I rewrote it because that's what you have to do. But the reason that it, it sort of builds, and, I, and with apologies for anybody who, who hasn't read it, um, is that, is that the, her point in her struggle after her, her time at, a, at the men's magazine is that she, her experience as a woman was not ever given so much credence and her, her life as a woman hadn't been made important by anything she had ever read. And so she is slowly becoming comfortable telling, doing what she usually does, which is tell the story of a man, but then finally be able to tell her own story um, through this very same man until finally he vanishes in the last third. And that last scene is just something she makes up. It's a good question. That's a good answer. Thank you. Another question? Don't be shy. That's it. <laughs> There's a guy there. In couple, it. Couple, yeah. I love the book. Thank you. Um, I have a question about um, the narrator, Libby, mm -hmm. and her sort of early obsession with, with Archer, who I also wanted to ask about. So sure. I guess this is the second time you're getting asked about Archer. Great. So she sort of worshipped him as a young journalist. But then she came to realize that his sort of hyper-masculine writing left out the point of view of women. So mm -hmm. I sort of suspected earlier on that you might switch to Rachel's side of the story at some point. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, you know, when I finally got to it, it was like very late in the book. And then when I got to understand Rachel and her side of the story, I didn't feel her as she as a character was vindicated at all. I still thought she was sort of a horrible person. And I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that wasn't the intent. Um, but was it meant to vindicate her in the eyes of the reader? I, I have a, you know, I always hear these things about, there's, there's this kind of um, conscience you're supposed to have when you're choosing the subjects of who you write about, right? You write about Tanya Harding, is that okay? Giving mm -hmm. a criminal a very intimate voice. Um, a few years ago at the paper there was like, a, and, I, and I don't speak for the paper, but 
there was a profile of a Nazi. Remember the profile of the Nazi? Oh, yes. Nobody loved that um, <laughs> because they felt like it shouldn't exist. And I kind of go through these feelings of, I don't know if that's true. I don't know, maybe everyone deserves a story. Maybe if we just all understood, I believe ultimately that every, that every single person ha believes they have a, um, a defensible point of view. I did not intend for her to be vindicated. I intended for her to tell her story. And the amount of, I mean, the amount of people who say to me like that they are, that they are her and that they had to put their, the book down because, because they recognized themselves so much in her and saw that she was the villain of the book. They felt vindicated by that. It's really interesting to me what people think. I congratulate you on feeling that way because you obviously don't have like these, these confused feelings about what your role is in your own family. But, but people who do not necessarily understand if they are doing the right thing but believe strongly that there's only kind of one direction to go in, I felt like, I also felt like it was kind of a good, like a punk rock good move to have that come and not, and not be like, mm -hmm. it turns out she was in an alley curing, curing cancer, <laughs> but she couldn't tell anybody, but, you know, like I feel like I've read that book a few times. Um, there's also, and in that way, it's a little bit of satire, and it's a little bit of, of fatigue from the amount of woman disappearing stories I've read mm. recently. Like it seems like lately, the most interesting thing a woman could do is le is like dis disappear, <laughs> and that's that's something we should look at, right? So it's a good question. Can I can I interrupt for the next question for just a, your question prompts something that I was thinking about too, which is. Among, you are a great observer. It's one of your skills Thank and talents you. as a journalist is just being able to go into situations and observe them. And I'm very curious about the things that you've observed in your time going around and talking to people about this book, which oh my gosh. has elicited so much intense response from so many readers who see themselves in the book or they just love the book as readers. Um, and obviously there's just way too much for you to summarize that in one answer, but I, I am curious how many, what, what are the kinds of things that you're, what are the most common things that you're hearing from people who wait after you know, your readings around the country and come up to you and talk to you about what the book has meant to them? So I have someone very close to me who read the book and said, the first thing she said after knowing me my whole life said to me, I could not relate to one thing in your book. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, where is this going? And it, w it seemed very important to her that I n not think that there was anything in that book that she, like, that she would be made al alive by. I know a lot of people in, in what I think of gr are great marriages um, who read the book and who like there are a lot of people who understand that marriage is not necessarily a really easy or good way to spend your independence, <laughs> although it is. Although they wouldn't do it another way. Like there's also that, right? Um, that quote about capitalism or the democracy, mm -hmm. like uh, the best form of government except all the other, the worst form of government except all the other ones, um, and and there are a lot of people who think it's audacious for me to write that and isn't my husband embarrassed? And that to me says a lot of things about the things that they're keeping to themselves. This specific person who maybe also had two sisters who got divorced this summer, um, I couldn't believe that she, that that was her feedback. Mm. One of four. <laughs> hmm. All right, let's keep going. There was a question in the back. Yeah. Hey, thanks so much for uh, spending time with us. Thank um, you. One quick question going back on some of the things that we were talking about, the structure of the book mm -hmm. and how Toby really dominates. And it, was it purposeful to highlight his failings, like that he was so focused on his perspective 
he wasn't really thinking, you know, more broadly about, you know, the, the burdens, you know, on, on his wife. I was just curious if that was purposeful, you know, to have uh, the majority of the book be from his vantage point and to leave less space, you know, for Rachel. I think that that's the only, you know, when we, I'll answer it this way, that when we were discussing, when there were, when there were suitors for, for this material to be adapted in Hollywood, there were a lot of people who wanted to do it as a movie. And I felt like it couldn't be done as a movie because you need to spend as much time with Toby as possible before, so that you are, bless you, so that you are really, really, really on his side for a very long time before you understand the reversal. Because, because I don't think that there are any real villains in this novel. I think that he is a, I think that he is a good father. I think she, for, for, for even despite her nervous breakdown, is a good mother. I think everybody is defensible. I kind of can see everyone's point of view on this. And I think it's there to ask hard questions about how we feel about certain people. But I don't think that it would have been effective if I had just like done it down the middle, right? I think that if I wrote a movie and it was two hours long and you spent like an hour and 10 minutes with Toby as this great father, like Toby, for all the ways that he, disapp that he disappoints his wife, he shows up for his children. He cooks them food. He, he finds the, he's engaged. So is she. They, despite her, her disappearance, which is just the plot of the, it's not, it's not from before. So I guess the answer is that I think that it wouldn't have worked if, I felt it, it wouldn't have worked if you had given everybody an equal amount of time. And it wouldn't have proven my point about the way women's stories are told. Does that make sense? I mean, does it? It's okay to say no. <laughs> it's okay to tell me that that didn't really answer the question. <laughs> Thank you. This is all very enlightening, but the piece that I'm taking away from it, and tell me particularly with your sisters, is that if that's not it, is hey, the hey, I didn't say anything. That, that, yeah, <laughs> I, I won't tell them. It's the relationships that the rest of us have. So it's like, is it the husband's story or the wife's story? And you used to be friends with both of them. Right. And now, which one do you follow? And then you find out that there's a little bit of the other. So I think that balance and then not a balance of relationships. All of us are affected, not just, uh-oh, is my husband also thinking the same thing? Or will this happen to me? But I really like both of them, except now I choose sides. Right, and except now you do choose sides. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a very interesting thing. And also to, your, to, to the question I maybe answered <laughs> prior to this, is that, is that when you, in the experiences you have, where you're, where you're, um, where you have a friend who's divorced, you listen to those stories and you're horrified by the person they married. But if you were to listen to the other person's story, you would feel the same way about your friend. And I think that is principally the point I was trying to make. That in all of these divorce stories that I heard, the thing I heard most of all was this kind of lack of communication that people were having. Um, all the men I asked, I'd say, why are you getting divorced? And they'd say, because my wife was so angry all the time. And I'd say to the women, why are you getting divorced? And they'd say, because I was so angry all the time. <laughs> and he never asked me why. And I always thought that that was just really interesting. I always thought, I was, and I think about a lot of things. I think about the Tanya Harding story. Like, what if I had done the Nancy Kerrigan story? That would have been different, right? Thank you. Um, I read the book and I really liked it, but I wanted to ask you about your New York Times Magazine profiles. Is that okay? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm just curious, do you think at this point that celebrities are a little frightened when they're assigned you? <laughs> Don't take that the wrong way. You know, that's my boss, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. She's really good at it. I mean, <laughs> I, I have a lot of, 
I have a lot of people who are pitching me a lot. And I think that I think that there are a couple of, I can only think of two people who were demonstrably unhappy with their story. Um, but I don't know, it's not my job. I don't, I don't care if they're scared, like, this is my job. Like, if I cared, I would be terrible at it because I'd be one of those people inside the story where you were like, ugh, it's them two together, right? I don't, I don't work for them. I'm never going to see them again. I thought until I started a television show, and now, mm -hmm. now it's different. Now, um, you're right, now you're in the casting chair. And now I'm in a, oh my god, it's very. Well, Mr. Cooper. <laughs> yes, yeah. I, so. Uh, we have a line Bradley, reading again Bradley. here. <laughs> but I, so they're very, the ones that you think were unhappy with their stories were not. But also, it like, it, I have to work very hard to make sure I don't care because I also can't care if I'm sent to a political candidate. I did a story on sexual harassment this year. Those people don't like me either. Um, my husband likes to say, um, journalism, the, hour, the hours are terrible and the money is shit, but at least everyone hates us. <laughs> <laughs> I, it's just like something I can't, I, do I think about what'll happen when it all runs out? Uh, sometimes. But I also think that, that, that it hasn't. Like I just, I, my most recent story is the highest earning and most powerful person in Hollywood. So I don't know. I don't know. Maybe. Who knows? Although it is what an interesting question whether you're, um, I mean, you're famous for a certain kind of observational Intensity that's generally good humored, right? You know, you you don't you kind of figure out a way to tell your subject secrets in a way that they might not want to do themselves, right? You sort of figure out what it is they're expressing in sometimes nonverbal ways, what it is that Gwyneth is cooking for you, you know, what the kind of situation she's arranged to have you observe when you're, and then you sort of take that apart. And there's definitely there's definitely some an acidic quality right. to some of that, but it's all there's a good-natured like love of humanity that that runs through that stuff. But my question is whether or not the <laughs> sorry whether or not the people when you go to see them are like in a heightened state of panic and anxiety because they know you're observing them. They're in a heightened state of panic because there's a journalist in the room. No, but not any journalist. I don't know if they're if everyone's such a subscriber like we think. <laughs> I think people. <laughs> People I'm not know sure. who you are. People know who you, you are. You know what I see? I see that there's like a general contempt for journalists mm -hmm. that even goes through our most liberal celebrities. Um, I did a secondary interview for Bradley Cooper's, for Bradley Cooper on Todd Phillips. Um, he, he was his director on The Hangover and is most recently the director of, of The Joker. And he said, to, he said to me, he said to me, just so you know, I'm taping you. And I said, well, just so you know, I'm taping you. Yeah. And, and if my tape doesn't work, will you please send me yours? <laughs> and I, it's, it's, it's astonishing to me how wary people are. I think more than anything, by the time I get to them, like my beat is not n like ingenues. By the time they get to me, they They're pissed. Have, they, they have been so screwed <laughs> by so many people. And right. the one thing I'm not, I think, is, is mean-spirited. Right. And also, this is an interesting thing that I wouldn't have known when I was starting out, which is that you never know what their goal is with the story. Gwyneth Paltrow loved that story, which was extremely confusing to a lot of people, including me. And the answer, I think, is that she wanted a story that took her seriously as a business owner. And I took her seriously as a business owner. I didn't call her a dilettante. I didn't say she's like a former actress dabbling in something. I said she was a perhaps dangerous person who was doing this thing. And that she's, she's, yes, I am. I'm a martyr for this cause. And, she, and I didn't lie to her. And I don't ever lie. And that's all I could do, because I have a job. Because it is so much more important that my editors like me <laughs> than like a movie star, right? Like, I can't, like how, do I, like, how do I control for how a movie star feels about me? All I could do is, is do my work with integrity, 
and remember who I work for, which is not just my editors, but you, right? Wouldn't you rather have me out there than someone who is trying to be liked? Well, that's my tepid, I don't know. Maybe I'll stop working next year and I'll have to, Please. maybe I'll be on like the obituary beat. <laughs> They'll put me in obits. Right, they don't ever complain. <laughs> do we have any, do we have, yeah? I was wondering if you could comment on um, Toby's lover, the, the woman who was divorced and sort of the Nahid. woman in the cat. Because for me, that was the moment when, when he, when you, when all of a sudden he saw her facial hair or he saw the hair. Yeah, her, her arm hair. Like, okay, I hate him. Yeah. You know, like, because it was like he saw her only as, you realize that as a function for him in his life. Mm. And so I just was wondering what, because I felt like that had a huge narrative function, mm -hmm. her role in the book. So I was wondering if you'd comment on that a little bit. So there are a bunch of different breadcrumbs in the book that lead you, that lead you to that. That is the last a good litmus test on this book is like, at what point, what was that point for you? For some people, it is, it is when he sends his kids off to camp against their will. For you mean, what is the point at which you turn on Toby? The point you turn on Toby. Mm -hmm. so at, to some people, it's like that he goes out to have sex the night he's told them his, his, that their mother is gone. I commend you for still being on his side after he throws raw meat at his wife. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, but, that, but it's the point of the book that I really truly believe that what, and it's a thing that I have to be very careful about. Obviously my work as a, as a magazine writer was very much on my mind because I do think that when you convey somebody's opinion, you are making them sympathetic. That was the problem with the Nazi article, right? That, you know, that, you know, that's why I keep thinking like, should I pitch a Donald Trump Jr. story? Like, what if I go and I like him? Like, what if I can find something amazing about him? And, and what if I come back and get fired because I wrote a cuddly <laughs> Donald, I don't know, I don't know. I don't know what's gonna happen. But I do know that the minute, the minute that somebody tells you, the minute that somebody is telling your story, it is inherently sympathetic. And I have always found that interesting. So that was, the, that was the narrative point of it. But there are a bunch of little breadcrumbs that build to that. And, and if, if your point came then, it is, it is because you have a, an extraordinarily sympathetic heart and that you're willing to listen to other people's stories. That's a great quality. You put up with a lot of bullshit. Up with a lot of bullshit. <laughs> There's a question in the back. Like. Uh, there, I Hi, Lisa. Over here. My own fame. Yeah, my cousin from California has like, you know, coffee shop. And so it's not. Who is that person? <laughs> <laughs> Are they on any apps that you uh, <laughs> look at? I have to tell you, I don't really know how to. My my children think I'm famous. Like because they're, the, the, t the teachers at the school we send our children to, Aliza and I are parents at the same school, um, those people talk to my children about my book <laughs> in a way that would shock you um, and that I've had to go in and talk about. Really? Yeah, a couple of times. What like, do they say? They say things, okay, so there's this one guy who every time he sees my nine-year-old goes, Where's Fleischman? Is he in trouble? <laughs> He's, it's every time. <laughs> and there, there is the newly divorced teacher at school who told my 12-year-old, he's like, tell your mother that her book meant a lot to me. <laughs> <laughs> and so my 12-year-old so my came home and said, like, you know, Mrs. Smith has a new last name and she wants you to know that her book meant, your book meant a lot to her. And they just want me to be their mother. And I understand that. I understand that. And I say one day, what the thing that I will that I do is going to be cool to you. But when, but like, I live in a very small town where my book was in the window of words for a for a long time. But other than that, you know, um, you know how like like it, it's a very interesting thing to call me famous when I have to like dress up differently to meet Tom Hanks in a in a in a conference room that's been rented under a different name because 
he's Tom Hanks. I'm fine. I can go anywhere. I'm going to walk out of here and just get into a car. But what? But you, prob you probably have been on the opposite side of the Q&A routine much more in the past you know, yeah. eight months. Yeah. So with Tom Hanks. Tom Hanks. Oh, he turned it back on you? Tur Tom yeah. Hanks turned yeah, it back yeah. on me. And yeah. I was like, well, Tom Hanks. Yeah. And, and that was very strange. And a couple of people have reached out to me to tell me they read my book. And it's very weird. Like famous. Celebrities. Like, yeah. Like, you know, there are, there are a couple of lines. There's a kind of celebrity that I interview who is a man in his 50s who has a who married an actress when he was young. Very specific. Div but there are 20 of them. <laughs> Divorced the actress after having two children. The actress's career is essentially over. He, at 45, sobers up, turns around, and either his babysitter or his assistant is suddenly looking amazing to him, and he marries that person, and then has two more kids. Whereas the, the, the wife, the first wife, is stuck with the first two kids, because she can't have more kids at like 50, unless she can. Some people do that. But it's not really like you get married a second time. Women can't really do that. And there's a line in there about it. And a couple of guys have written to me, and I'm, and I'm so worried. I'm, I'm like, oh, you read that? Did you not realize that that line was about uh, you? <laughs> it was about you. So, so you specialize in that type of actor, but you, Josh Brolin. you, <laughs> you enter that situation right after the new kids have been born. That's your that's yeah, your and they are like young, and they, now they know how to live, and they have right. all the time in the world for the kid, and they except for during the day when they go to the meeting, and that like it's really. Unfair. And Gwyneth Paltrow and I spoke about this because she and I both wish we had had a third child. Mm. And right after my story came out, there was a rumor that Chris Martin, her first husband, was dating Dakota Johnson. That wasn't a rumor. That was true. But there was a rumor that Dakota was pregnant. And the minute I saw that, I started crying thinking about Gwyneth Paltrow who wanted a f third child that whole time and now has to see her, her ex-husband have, I mean, I, I, yeah. It's, it's like a weird video game where you make famous people into people in your life and you <laughs> watch them, so it's, I don't recommend it. Did but Marianne, did Marianne Williamson talk to you about your book? No, but she has reached out in the last few days. Mm, well, she has more time She's some, some time now. <laughs> uh, was there, was you, yeah. Well, first of all, I think that you need more friends who are divorced and dating, because we've all seen the app, and I don't yeah. think you have seen it. Um, <laughs> the only, um, I had a question. I feel like that, that it wasn't really about divorce, that it was about like connection and disconnection, because life is so hard. The human condition is so frail. This is like a modern moment. Um, and I thought that it was so interesting, and I don't know how intentional this was, but he was the one that wanted the divorce. Right. Which, when I read that, I thought, all of this comes undone. Mm. You, she, I, I, I read it as she would have kept the house of cards up right. until, so I don't know if that was intentional or not, but that was a really defining moment, I thought. That was yeah, it's all intentional. It, it's all intentional. It's the difference between like a, you know, it's like a, it's a novel. It's supposed to be about complicated people who, who have some really complicated ways about them, that he was miserable enough that he wanted to get divorced, that she could not even fathom that he would disrupt their lives this way while she was working so hard to make ends meet for them, even though she had created those ends. I mean, I can see it from both of them. I really can. If I ever met them. I think we have time for two more questions, if uh, anyone has any last thoughts. Yes, right here. Let's Seth. talk about Seth. No one ever asks yes, about Seth. Yes, finally, get to the finance part. Poor bro. Seth. Plot point, or because was he necessary for the book? Do you Ouch. Know? Um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But I mean, he's he's my husband has a friend, Seth, like like Seth. So, so he's just sort of a character that comes in and out. But he is there. He he is there. He is there because 
because first of all, a lot, about, a lot of what middle life is about is nostalgia for a certain period of time. And during the time that these three were friends um, is a time that they're, they're all kind of going back to right now. But more than that, she, you know, she represents a marriage that's working out. Uh, Toby represents a marriage that didn't work out. And Seth represents what mid middle life looks like if you didn't get married. And I thought that that was a, a very, um, I, I wonder if I, th I wonder if I think that I should have done more with him, hmm. um, because you're not the first person to say this. But in the making of the television show, when I walked in and I said, "Let's give <laughs> Seth more to do," their answer was, "Why? He serves his purpose, and he's he he's also there to show that everybody is lying, and not necessarily intentionally. Everybody is trying." Is, is conveying their point of view in the best way that they possibly can, and he is probably the most damaged of them. He might have the happiest marriage in the end. Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> Season two question. <laughs> <laughs> All right, one question? final question. Come on. Somebody. Cowards. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well then. Oh. There you go. Oh, we got one. Thank Nobody you. has Thank ever you, mentioned sir. Kramer versus Kramer, where Meryl Streep and Dustin Hoffman won Oscars for The Disappearing Wife. Uh, also, I wanted to, uh, I guess that's a comment, not yeah. are you asked Good about? Comment. Are you asked about Kramer versus Kramer? Um, I, I, I did not, I loved Kramer versus Kramer growing up. It was like one of those movies that I was like, yeah, like I didn't even realize it was about a divorce because my parents were like, it just seemed like, oh, it's about this Normal kid. Life. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but when they were writing marketing copy for my book, I heard about Kramer versus Kramer a lot. And they were like, look, like, oh, it's a modern Kramer versus Kramer. It's like, I don't know, can we compare it to a novel? Can we compare it to some <laughs> literature? <laughs> Is all the literature taken? And Rachel means you. It does? E In what? E-W-E. What? E-W-E, you. Uh, it does? In what language? Hebrew. It, it does? I happen to know Hebrew. And you want to hear the craziest thing about all of Definitely. I want to hear, I want to tell you the craziest thing, thanks to you, <laughs> um, is, so that, is that when my mother, when she, when she emigrated from Israel, which is how I speak Hebrew, from her speaking it, at me, um, <laughs> when she, she decided to change her name to something very American. She changed it to Daniela. Meanwhile, the only Daniela's I know are, are Israeli. But, <laughs> but her, he, her original name is Rachel, which I hadn't remembered or thought about, but I named that character. Mm. She had some comments hey. about that. <laughs> I think we should end here, but I do believe that it is important for us as an audience to know whether that is the first time you've said that in an interview. It is. That's the first wow. time I've said that. Well, what a what a look, you guys! All sorts of new, breaking, exclusive. <laughs> you all have an exclusive here. So before we wrap up, I want to just say, on behalf of all of us, and definitely on my behalf, congratulations! Aww, thank to you. you. It's incredible. Thank you. Thank you. And can I say thank you for doing this? Yes. You see me enough. You read enough of my No, I don't. Crap. I don't. I, I want to see plenty of mine. And, and good luck on the TV show. Thank you. I appreciate it. And thank you for having me. Here. Yes. Thank you um, for so coming. thank you, everybody, for coming. Our, our next program is on January 26th. Andrew Morantz will be talking about his book, Antisocial. You can get flyers on the way out. Good and good book. Um, and um, Margo is in the back, watch on booksellers if you'd like to buy a copy of the book. And do you have- I'm happy to, to I'm happy to sign. So, and, um, I'll sign so whatever you want me to sign. Okay, thanks, for, thanks everybody. <laughs>